Siskel and Ebert called it one of the worst films of 1993. It cost $48 million to make and grossed just under $21 million. It was over budget and behind schedule. The Super Mario Brothers movie was the first major motion picture based on a video game. The game franchise was a huge success. It made sense to bring that magic to the big screen. But by most accounts, it was a disaster from start to finish. In recent years, several actors who worked on the film called the experience a nightmare. There was on-set drinking, constant script rewrites, and a pair of directors who were openly disliked. Sometimes the story behind a movie is better than the movie itself, and that's definitely the case with the Super Mario Brothers movie. Let's take a look. The Super Mario Brothers movie seemed like a safe bet. After three successful games on the Nintendo Entertainment System, as well as a highly anticipated release on the Super Nintendo, the franchise was a critical and commercial hit. Mario was one of the most recognizable video game characters of all time. The success carried over to merchandise, cereal, and a cartoon series. There was even a movie, but it wasn't live action. Super Mario Brothers: The Great Mission to Rescue Princess Peach was a Japanese animated film released in 1986. It was one of the first movies based on a video game, but it never saw release outside of Japan. A major motion picture seemed like the next logical step. Hollywood's biggest producers saw an opportunity in Super Mario Brothers and were willing to pay up. Offers poured into Nintendo in the 5 to 10 million dollar range, but for Nintendo it wasn't about the money. They didn't need it. Critics panned Nintendo's first foray into movies, the 1989 film The Wizard, for being a 96-minute Nintendo commercial. This time around, they wanted to find the best fit, hoping to not repeat past mistakes. In the fall of 1990, Nintendo shocked just about everyone when they gave away the movie rights for just $2 million. And who they sold it to was even more surprising. A small production company known as Light Motive, led by independent filmmakers Jake Eberts and Roland Jaffe. Although the pair wasn't exactly known for making family-friendly films, their resume was impressive. They were best known for the 1984 film The Killing Fields, about the genocide of two million people in Cambodia. The film won three Oscars and was nominated for seven. Eberts and Jaffe saw potential in Super Mario Bros. Not as a way to show off their creativity and bring their vision of the Mushroom Kingdom to life, but as a way to bring in cash to their small studio and become full-time producers. During the pitch to Nintendo president Hiroshi Yamauchi, Jaffe imagined a prequel story with an edge, one that would appeal to adults as well as kids. He sweetened the deal by offering something the bigger movie studios wouldn't, some creative control, and all the merchandising rights. Nintendo saw the whole idea as little more than an experiment. In their eyes, the Mario franchise was too big to fail. Yamauchi also liked Jaffe's vision of a gritty film. It seemed like a win-win. Nintendo could be in the loop, and Eberts and Jaffe would get the movie rights at a huge discount. What could go wrong? With input from Nintendo, Eberts and Jaffe got to work assembling a team. The most important question being, who would play Mario? It seemed as though fortune was on their side when Dustin Hoffman expressed interest in the lead role. He just won a second Academy Award and had a great reputation for his roles in The Graduate, Rain Man, and All the President's Men. Jaffe was ecstatic when he heard the news, but Nintendo of America President Minoru Arakawa wasn't. He didn't think Hoffman was the right man for the job, so they turned him down. Their next choice was Danny DeVito, whose star was rising after successful roles in Twins and War of the Roses. He was also the actor who most closely resembled Mario. However, DeVito wanted to read the script before signing on, and he eventually turned it down. Following that rejection, Light Motive reached out to Tom Hanks, and he actually agreed to play Mario. He was set to take the role for $5 million, but before he signed the contract, Nintendo and the producers got cold feet. At the time, Tom Hanks was in a bit of a slump. The Burbs in 1989 and Joe vs. the Volcano in 1990 received mixed reviews, and The Bonfire of the Vanities, which also came out in 1990, was just bad. Entertainment Weekly called it one of the most indecently bad movies of the year. 
So for a very short time, Tom Hanks' stock was down. Nintendo and the producers worried that Tom Hanks wasn't worth $5 million and didn't have the it factor to carry a dramatic movie. Tom Hanks had already starred in huge movies like Splash, Big, and Turner and Hooch. He even received an Academy Award nomination for his starring role in Big. But until that point, he was really only known for his comedic roles. They wanted the Super Mario Bros. movie to be dark and gritty. They worried that Tom Hanks couldn't handle it. So, before Hanks could sign anything, Nintendo and the producers pulled the offer. They discovered their error pretty quickly. In 1993, the same year that the Super Mario Bros. movie debuted at the box office, Tom Hanks starred in the groundbreaking film Philadelphia. He received an Oscar for his performance as a closeted gay man who eventually dies of AIDS. After rejecting Dustin Hoffman and Tom Hanks, and getting rejected by Danny DeVito, Light Motive finally found the man for the job, British actor Bob Hoskins. They were impressed by his range. He'd received an Oscar nomination for his dramatic role in the 1986 film Mona Lisa, and was fresh off a successful leading role in Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Bob Hoskins accepted the role primarily for the money, but he also thought the initial script was good. He didn't even know the Super Mario Bros. movie was based on a video game until after he accepted the role. His son filled him in. Soon after Bob Hoskins signed on, John Leguizamo took the role of Luigi. At the time, Leguizamo was so sure the Super Mario Bros. movie would be a success that when a major TV network offered to develop a sitcom about his life, he turned them down. He thought he was too good for TV. For the role of Koopa, the producers needed a steely villain. Arnold Schwarzenegger and Michael Keaton were both offered the part, but they declined. Ultimately, Dennis Hopper, whose lengthy acting career included parts in Apocalypse Now and Hoosiers, landed the role. Samantha Mathis, who went on to appear in American Psycho and The Punisher, played Princess Daisy. But if there's one thing more important than getting the right actors, it's getting the right directors and writers. And that's where the Super Mario Brothers movie went spiraling out of control. After Nintendo and Light Motive struck their movie deal, Roland Jaffe hired Greg Beeman as director. Beeman was still a relatively new director. He had just one film under his belt, the 1988 comedy License to Drive, starring Corey Haim and Corey Feldman. Meanwhile, Barry Morrow, who had just won an Oscar for the screenplay to Rain Man, worked on the script. Morrow played Super Mario Brothers for a day, and afterward crafted a mythical story that revolved around a complex relationship between two brothers. But the story was too dark, and too similar to Rain Man. Morrow didn't appreciate the feedback. He dropped out and passed writing duties off to two newcomers, Jim Genowine and Tom S. Parker. The pair were up and coming in the world of Hollywood writing. They had just sold a script that would become the 1992 movie Stay Tuned for $750,000 and were looking for more work. In their script, the lizard King Koopa kidnaps Luigi's love interest, Hildy, so he can gain access to the crown of invincibility. Mario, Luigi, and their sidekick Toad set off to rescue her. It was a simple fantasy plot, and it closely resembled the actual games. The script contained references to Goombas, Thwomps, bob Chain Chomps, and even the Hammer Brothers. Meanwhile, Light Motive Studios sought funding for the film. However, distributors were hesitant to pay up with newbie Greg Beeman as director. Roland Jaffe let him go, saying Beeman, quote, didn't have the stretch for it. Joffe sought out a new director, and he eventually settled on a husband and wife duo, Annabelle Jenkel and Rocky Morton. Jenkel and Morton didn't have a ton of big screen experience. They'd only directed one movie, a 1988 thriller called DOA. It starred Dennis Quaid and Meg Ryan and received mixed reviews. But the couple had a fresh, innovative style, and their work was impressive. They directed music videos for Elvis Costello, Miles Davis, and The Talking Heads and they'd done some major commercials. But what really set them apart was Max Headroom, 20 Minutes into the Future, a TV movie that ran on Channel 4 in the UK. The futuristic show featured an actor made to look like a computer-generated TV host. Max Headroom was weird and edgy. It had a very defiant early MTV vibe. They created Max Headroom along with screenwriter George Stone and directed the TV movie together. 
the idea eventually became a TV show in the UK and the United States. Their style seemed like a good match for the producer's vision of a darker, more adult-skewed Mario movie. When Jenkel and Morton read Genuine and Parker's fairy tale script, they hated it, but they saw potential in a Super Mario Bros. movie. Morton turned to Jenkel and said, This script is terrible, but I think this could be our Batman. To bring their vision to life, Jenkel and Morton hired Chicago-based writers Parker Bennett and Terry Runt, whose only claim to fame was the odd dark comedy Mystery Date, starring Ethan Hawke. Bennett and Runt kept the same basic plot from the fairy tale script, but gave it a sci-fi twist. Nintendo was somewhat concerned about the direction the movie was heading, but to their surprise, they actually enjoyed the new script. It looked as if all the puzzle pieces had been found. That is, until directors Annabelle Jenkel and Rocky Morton stepped in. Even with the sci-fi element, the directors felt the new script was too boring. They thought it needed pumping up. The pair wanted to create a parallel universe where dinosaurs survived and evolved. The dinosaur land, called Dino Hatton, would be ruled by the evil King Koopa. Mario and Luigi would access the universe via a portal in the New York sewer system. With that direction, Bennett and Runt took another crack at the script. Their second version included the Dino Hatton element, plus a Mario character that closely resembled the mix of humor and sleaze that Bill Murray brought to his role in Ghostbusters. But once Bob Hoskins signed on, the character was reworked to be older and more appealing. Bennett and Runt worked quickly to revise the script, but they didn't work fast enough for those in charge. Bennett and Runt were fired. The directors replaced them with Dick Clement and Ian Lafrene. Together they created a more action-heavy script. It was so action-packed that the initial script even called for a Bruce Willis cameo. But Nintendo and the producers thought that version was a little over the top, so the writers toned it down. Everyone was happy. For about a minute. Distributors thought the script was too dark. Then the producers got cold feet. They worried that the script, which at this point all the actors had signed on for and the directors approved of, strayed too far from the video games. To solve this, the producers hired new writers to revise the script even further, but with one condition. The directors were forbidden to work with the writers. To the producers, it seemed like the only way to save the script from overbearing directors. But to the directors, it was a slap in the face. Writers Ed Solomon, known for his work on the Bill and Ted movies, and Ryan Rowe were called in to doctor the existing script. They added more Disney-friendly elements, like a wedding for Mario and his girlfriend Daniela. They also lightened up some of the more serious scenes and toned down some budget-busting ideas. When Jenkel and Morton saw the revised script, they almost walked out, but they had already come so far. The set was complete, designed by David Snyder, who is known for his work on Blade Runner. All of the actors were on board. The project even had solid financing. Disney's Hollywood Pictures agreed to back the film. The directors felt they had no choice. Jenkel and Morton stuck around, hoping to steer the movie while filming to match their vision. In the summer of 1992, production started in an abandoned cement factory in Castlehane, North Carolina, just outside of Wilmington. It was time to film the Super Mario Brothers movie. When the actors arrived on set the following week and received their new scripts, they were stunned. It was completely different than the script they were pitched. They expressed their displeasure to the producers, who incredibly brought Parker Bennett and Terry Runt back out to help revise the script yet again, as well as consult on set. It was a frustrating process, made even worse by a lack of communication between directors, producers, and actors. The sweltering heat didn't help either, as temperatures shot above 90 degrees in the humid North Carolina summer. But the cast and crew did have one thing uniting them, a common enemy, directors Rocky Morton and Annabelle Jenkel. In early August of 1992, with production underway, freelance journalist Richard Staten captured the onset turmoil in an article for the Los Angeles Times. He wrote that the cast and crew were so unhappy with the directors that they'd begun mocking the couple. They gave them nicknames, Rockabelle, a combination of their first names, was the most flattering. They also called them Rocky and Annabelle, the Flying Squirrel Show, and Hydra. 
British actor Bob Hoskins summed them up in perhaps the least flattering way when he told John Leguizamo, not all English people are like them. He's a c and she's a cow. He would later say that Rocky and Annabelle's arrogance had been mistaken for talent. Bob Hoskins wasn't the only one who was frustrated, and he definitely wasn't the only one to talk openly about it. Dennis Hopper said that Rocky Morton and Annabelle Jenkel were, quote, control freaks and wouldn't talk to each other before they made decisions. The directors contradicted one another on a regular basis, which made it harder for people to perform their jobs. But no behind-the-scenes anecdote illustrates the on-set atmosphere quite as well as a now-infamous story about Rocky Morton, an extra, and a cup of hot coffee. According to John Leguizamo, Morton was looking at the extras on set and was not happy with what he saw. He thought the costumes looked too pristine. He grabbed a coffee and poured it all over one of the extras. The actor was wearing a rubber mask, but it wasn't sealed at the neck, so the hot coffee seeped through the suit and burned him. The man screamed. Morton said, oh well, he's just an extra, and shrugged. Morton has since argued against Leguizamo's version of this story. He says that Leguizamo was too far away to see what really happened. According to Morton, he thought the costumes needed to be more dirty, so he picked up some mud from the set and chucked it onto an extra's costume, but it didn't stick. He thought some coffee would help make mud stick to the costume, so he picked up a cup that had been sitting around for a while and said to the extra, I'm going to pour this on you to stick the mud on, is that okay? When he poured it on, the man screamed. Morton says he apologized and got cool water for the man's shoulder. At some point, maybe after this incident, the crew made t-shirts with all of the rude or dismissive comments that the directors made, and they didn't keep them tucked away in a closet. They actually wore them on set. The constant script rewrites made matters even worse. The script changed so much every day that the actors didn't see the point in reading the new copies. Dennis Hopper said, the script had probably been rewritten five or six times by the time I arrived here. I don't really bother with it anymore. I just go in and do it scene by scene. I figure it's not going to hurt my character. Bob Hoskins had pretty much the same approach. He said, all these rewrites get frustrating, so I don't do too much research. One scene originally called for strippers, which the crew hired locally in Wilmington, North Carolina. But when the producers got wind of this, they quickly changed the scene to dancing at a nightclub. The actors and the rest of the crew learned to take it one day at a time and to accept that the newest script would be a lot different than the one they signed up for, but it was a bitter pill to swallow. Fiona Shaw, who played Lena, was increasingly disenchanted. When she heard rumors of a scene where she and Dennis Hopper would sit in a mud bath filled with $3,000 worth of worms, she was disgusted. She said, the first script I got was witty. That was maybe 10 scripts ago. Now they're talking about taking a bath with worms. But as Leguizamo would later say, the worse the movie, the better the partying. The crew partied through their misery. Leguizamo and Hoskins actually did shots of scotch between shoots. One day, Leguizamo and Hoskins were drinking scotch when they were called in to shoot a stunt scene. The scene called for Luigi to drive the Mario Brothers van. Hoskins didn't show any signs that he'd been drinking, but Leguizamo definitely did. In the scene, Leguizamo accelerated just as Hoskins shouted his line, Come on Luigi, Koopa's getting away. So Leguizamo slammed on the gas, then quickly slammed on the brake. The van almost tipped over. When Hoskins grabbed the door frame, the sliding door shut on his hand, hard. Hoskins unleashed a long line of profanities. Leguizamo remembered it as, quote, a kind of Cockney Tourette's. For the rest of production, Hoskins wore a cast, which they painted a pale pink color to match his skin. But it wasn't all bad. Leguizamo and Samantha Mathis started dating while they filmed the movie. In his book, Leguizamo says that meeting Samantha was just about the only good thing to come of the movie. The making of the Super Mario Brothers movie was a dramatic mess, but it would be unfair to pin all the blame on the directors. Jankel and Morton were pioneering something that hadn't been done on a large scale, and it was a pretty challenging task. Their music videos and TV show were good, but it was a big leap to go from that to directing a $48 million, first of its kind, big budget video game movie. On top of that, they weren't really allowed to do what they did best. 
The producers hired Jenkel and Morton because the pair had a gritty, futuristic style. They were edgy and different. But when it came time to actually make the movie, the producers, the studio, and Nintendo got nervous. They pulled back. They wanted to make the movie more comedic, family-friendly, and a little less weird. And what they got was something in between. Morton called the project a harrowing experience. The script that he and Jenkel wanted was more sophisticated than the final product, and that in the version they fought for, the bond between the two brothers was a much bigger, more emotional part of the story. But when the studio wanted something different, Jenkel and Morton felt they had little choice but to go along. It was tough. He said, I had to stand by with the new script, obviously, and tell them that it was great, when I knew it wasn't. It was tough from a technical standpoint, too. They had a huge set, but not enough money to properly light it. And with the script constantly changing, continuity was nearly impossible. After a grueling 15 weeks in production, it was time to edit the film. But to Morton's surprise, the directors were locked out of the editing room, forbidden to intervene. They had to get help from the Directors Guild of America just to get in the room. Through all the drama, somehow, a movie was filmed and edited. Nintendo knew the final product wouldn't be good, but they were still confident it would make a lot of money, thanks to the Mario brand. They were in for a rude awakening. The Super Mario Bros. movie hit the box office in May of 1993. It bombed. Fans of the franchise were confused. They thought they'd be watching a movie that was bright and fun, an action-packed, family-friendly adventure but the movie strayed pretty far from the beloved video games that inspired it. They got an entirely different plot. When a meteorite hit Earth 65 million years ago, it created a drab, parallel dimension where dinosaurs survived. Over time, the dinosaurs evolved into humanoids. King Koopa rules the humanoids, but he wants to merge the two dimensions so that he can rule humans and humanoids. But the only way to do that is by using a meteorite fragment, which Princess Daisy wears around her neck. When Koopa's henchmen Iggy and Spike kidnap Daisy, Mario and Luigi set out to save her. The two plumbers enter an underground portal, where they are transported from Manhattan to dino Hatton, where they aim to save the princess and defeat King Koopa. Along the way, there are some weirdly adult scenes, some unsuccessful attempts at humor, and most of the time, it feels like the constant action sequences are just meant to distract from the fact that there isn't much of a plot. There are, however, some nods to the games. There are bob -ombs, Goombas, Yoshi, and Bullet Bills. The woman in the nightclub is named Big Bertha, a reference to the fish enemy from Mario 3. There's even a character named Toad. Mario and Luigi are plumbers, though they may have hit that reference home a little too hard, and they eventually do wear their iconic red and green overalls. But none of that was enough to satisfy fans of the franchise, and the story wasn't strong enough to draw in people who weren't hooked on the games. In trying to appeal to everyone, the movie appealed to no one, and the critics took notice. A popular video game, it's called Super Mario Brothers, and it doesn't work at all. This movie isn't either high or low tech enough. It's not as dazzling or as involving as the cutting edge video games that would like to mirror, and it doesn't have the traditional movie elements like compelling characters or a fresh story. I also can't figure out exactly what age group this movie was made for. You look at the movie and you see millions of dollars on the screen of special effects and all of those customized cars and that other world that yeah. they've created and everything else and it doesn't add up to anything. No. It's just a lot of people running around all talking at once and a plot that nobody cares anything about and just every once in a while a little moment that kind of sparkles. Dennis Hopper is kind of good in a couple of his speeches but it's a complete waste of time and money. But the reviews weren't all bad. Quite a few praised the talented cast and the fact that the movie is visually stunning, but such compliments were usually brought back down to earth pretty quickly. In a mostly positive review, Janet Maslin of the New York Times noted that the plot turns barely comprehensible in its last half hour. The movie grossed just under $21 million on a $48 million budget. Just a few weeks after Super Mario Bros. hit the box office, another dinosaur-filled movie made its debut, to much greater success. Over time, the Super Mario Bros. movie developed a reputation as being notoriously bad. 
Even decades after it debuted, the key cast and crew couldn't shake it. Annabelle Jankel and Rocky Morton haven't directed a movie since. After the in-depth LA Times article about the onset turmoil, Jankel and Morton were dropped by their agent. The scripts stopped coming. They couldn't get meetings, and the phone stopped ringing. Said Morton, nobody wanted to touch us. We were like lepers in Hollywood. Still to this day, I have projects and I call up the managers and agents to try and represent it, and they say, you did Super Mario Brothers? Oh God, it was like 20 years ago, but it's still there. But the directors weren't the only ones who were haunted by this movie. In a Q&A with The Guardian, Bob Hoskins was characteristically blunt. What is the worst job you've done? Super Mario Brothers. What has been your biggest disappointment? Super Mario Brothers. If you could edit your past, what would you change? I wouldn't do Super Mario Brothers. Dennis Hopper felt the same way. By the end of his life, he'd spent five decades in the business and appeared in more than 100 movies. When Conan O'Brien asked him if he regretted being in any of them, Hopper didn't hesitate. He said, I made a picture called Super Mario Brothers. My six-year-old son at the time, he's now 18, he said, Dad, I think you're probably a pretty good actor, but why did you play that terrible guy King Koopa in Super Mario Brothers? I said, well, Henry, I did that so you could have shoes. And he said, Dad, I don't need shoes that badly. It may seem like everybody hates this movie, and to be fair, most people do. But a funny thing has happened over the past few years. The Super Mario Brothers movie has developed a cult following. In 2014, it was released on Blu-ray in the United Kingdom. Websites like the Super Mario Brothers Movie Archive, which Ryan Haas started in 2007, deserve part of the credit for this shift in public opinion. The site is home to cast interviews, photos, and even contains some of the early draft scripts. Over time, Haas says he has seen the conversation about the movie evolve. People are more willing to reevaluate their initial thoughts on the movie. Through his interviews with the cast and crew, he sees that nowadays, a lot of people look back on the film and appreciate that what they were doing was unprecedented. For a while, it seemed like the Super Mario Bros. movie would be the first and last big-budget video game movie. But over time, we've seen a few video game adaptations hit the big screen. But most have been panned by critics, and their financial success varies significantly. Some say that the Super Mario Bros. movie had a chilling effect on video game movie adaptations. But things are starting to change. In May of 2016, 23 years after the Super Mario Bros. movie flopped, Nintendo announced that it was finally breaking back into the movie business. So what does this mean for the future? Well, it's hard to tell. If they can make a major hit, then Nintendo could pave the way for a slew of video game movie adaptations. But if the project bombs, then nothing will have changed. That's all for this episode of Gaming Historian. Thanks for watching.